speaker will be Dr. Megan Dutney, who is a, a citrus pathologist at the Citrus Research and Education Center. Sorry, it took me a moment to find my unmute button and it moved on me. Uh, thank you very much, Fernando. I am going to talk about the identification and management of common citrus diseases in the home landscape, but because of time, this is certainly not an exhaustive list. Hopefully my slides will start to change. Hmm. Not had this problem before. One second here, I'm going to try again. Hopefully this will work. Ah, perfect. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about are the fungal diseases. Um, the first disease I'm going to talk about is a very common one that we see on just nearly all types of citrus. It's greasy spot. Um, when we look, when we see symptoms initially, they come in as a yellow mottle that really disturbs people on the leaf surface. Um, and you can see that down here, you get matching yellow to orange blisters on the underside of the leaf, but uh, please uh, rest assured that most of that chlorosis will disappear. Um, eventually though, you get these lesions that become slightly raised and they're darker, such as an example here and here are the uh, uh, mature lesions on the under and upper sides of the leaf. And when you go to touch them, they're very smooth texture, unlike uh, another disease I'm going to talk about. However, this uh, disease does have a dark side in terms of that it tends to drop the leaves if they are too infected or the infections are near the abscission points and they uh, and the leaves will fall to the ground, causing some severe defoliation if let uh, go unchecked. Um, Looking at the fruit, this is worst on the grapefruit or the light colored fruit. Uh, you get necrotic spe specks on the rind, then they show up in between the uh, oil glands. So necrotic is just a fancy word for dead. Um, these are guard cells uh, around and the stomates. Uh, they start as a light pink, but yet quickly become brown to black. Um, at most of the time on other cultivars other than grapefruit and probably lemon, uh, the damage is too small or too light to really cause a blemish, but you can see it can really darken the surface of the grapefruit and it can be a little bit light, it's a little bit blue. Often it's mistaken for rust mite damage, um, but uh, the two can be quite difficult to distinguish if they're both somewhat um, uh, light levels of disease. Uh, the disease, uh, often we get calls in the winter months, but in fact, that is actually too late. The infections that cause those symptoms are occurring in May and June. Uh, this is when chemical control measures should be done if you're going to take that uh, approach. Um, and you really need to get good coverage of your canopy. Horticultural oil at a two to 4% per volume works well for oranges and mandarin leaves to keep those leaves on the tree and keeping that tree healthy. However, grapefruit's a bit more sensitive and copper really works better for the grapefruit in terms of keeping the fruit cleaner as well as keeping the leaves on the tree. I like also grow, uh, homeowners to look at doing uh, leaf litter removal as a cultural control. So raking and bagging your leaves after the February leaf drop and covering them in a compost that's away from your tree or putting them in your yard waste stream if that's available in your home area. When we are looking at managing um, the disease, I've got the disease cycle here. I'm not going to have time to go through, but I want you to think about the, the fact that you're taking um, out this uh, stage where the the fungus is growing on the surface of the leaves and the plants before it actually infects. So that's the vulnerable point. So timing is pretty important for that late May, mid-June timing to get good control. 
Melanosis, the second fungal disease that I'm going to talk about, and it affects, again, most varieties. Uh, we see initial lesions on the fruit, twigs, and leaves. So like here, we've got on the twigs, uh, starts off as individual specks. They're reddish brown, so kind of a rusty color. And you get uh, this chlorosis again that will regreen. You can get distortion of the flush if it's particularly severe in a spot. And when you go to touch it, unlike the greasy spot, it feels like sandpaper. So that's an easy way to distinguish between the two. Uh, fruit lesions will vary depend on size, depending on when the fruit is infected. Uh, it's particularly bad on grapefruit, but I have seen mel melanose on just about any type of fruit. Uh, if it, the fruit are large when they're infected, you get this uh, pinpoints of and a slightly roughened surface. Uh, but when they're younger, you could see here, we get these whole plaques where the lesions have merged or coalesced. And you also see tear streaking down the side of the fruit, um, which is typical for melanose and usually pretty indicative of the problem. So how to, how to manage melanose? Well, first thing, most of the inoculum is coming out of the dead wood. The symptoms are on the twigs are really the only place where the fungus is able to complete its life cycle, and particularly if you're pruning targeting twigs smaller than a half inch in diameter. You won't get all of them, but you can really reduce your uh, inoculum and dispose of the dead wood with your yard waste. Brush piles are known to be a source of these secondary spores that become airborne and can then trans go back to your trees. Grapefruit, again, is particularly susceptible, but like greasy spot, it does not harm the edibility. These are perfectly fine to eat, usually. Um, if you're planning to use chemical control, copper applications are really your best option. Uh, applications should start in late April and continue through mid-July every 21 days. Um, and uh, if anybody has any further questions about these two, I'll be happy to answer. Moving on to bacterial diseases, uh, they tend to be a little bit more uh, problematic here in Florida. The leaf lesions are, are visible on both sides of the leaf for citrus canker, um, the, uh, a very common uh, home garden problem. Uh, initial lesions are often pinpoint stop spots, very subtle as you can see here in this first picture. Um, it, they're quite small under, under a, a half inch, often starting as a quarter inch. Uh, slightly raised blister lesions, but they do get much larger as you can see here uh, and here. They're um, circular to irregular in shape. They often have a very prominent yellow halo as you can see, uh, and then the, the center will die out uh, and then that can even fall out giving an impression of shot hole in the, uh, in the leaves. Um, the center of the lesion will become raised and corky as the lesions age, but then they flatten again as, as um, as the leaf gets towards its end of, end of existence. Um, as those lesions age, they change color, turning from tan all the way to gray. Um, you'll often see a water-soaked margin. I'll have a good photo of that on fruit in a moment, uh, followed by a yellow ring or a halo, and then the margins become brown. And then uh, Dr. Diepenbrock did mention the leaf miner. I have an example of a leaf mine that has been colonized by the bacterium once uh, following the leaf miter. Leaf miter doesn't actually spread the disease, but it does allow the, the leaves to become much more severely affected than they would otherwise be without those wounds. Um, looking at the fruit, lesions are gray to dark brown uh, again, and uh, they're often, they're raised, they're surrounded by yellow halos, and you get these water soaked margins. Uh, as you can see here, just like you would see on the leaves sometimes. The fruit can be green around the lesions as the fruit uh, ripens, but the lesions age, you can see here. Uh, and then the lesion actually will be turned into a depression on the, on the uh, fruit surface. Um, and then we can also get significant fruit drop from this problem. Uh, uh, the lesions that are usually up, if the fruit's heavily infected or the lesions are up near the peduncle where they attach to the tree. Um, we also get uh, stem lesions, and these are what really per perpetuate the disease within the trees. Um, and they usually are, and they look a lot like the fruit lesions, and they usually indicate that the bacteria has been present for a long time on this tree, uh, but they can be very difficult to spot. Uh, they can be very subtle. So canker is caused by uh, Xanthomonas citri, subspecies citri, uh, bacterial disease, as I mentioned. Uh, Pretty much everything is susceptible to various extents, although grapefruit and lemons are highly susceptible. 
uh, early oranges as well. Um, canker spreads naturally through wind-blown rain, uh, particularly wind speeds above 18 miles per hour. And this is because when the lesions become moist, as you can see here in this diagram, they ooze bacteria back out. That gets picked up by the uh, wind and the rain. It gets forced into the tissues of this younger susceptible tissue, uh, into, these, into the stomatal chambers, and then all, or pruning wounds. And then the whole cycle will continue until you have either no more windblown rain or, um, or no more susceptible tissue for the year. So this is an example of what typical windblown rain would be for a good canker spread event. And uh, here you can see uh, some of the worst damage that canker can do, then that's, that's a piece of fruit that not even a hardy plant pathologist would want to eat. Um, so canker spread though, while it is very capable of moving by itself, uh, uh, we also are, are good vectors for this disease. Uh, long distance spread tends to be by movement of infected trees, seedlings, or other propagative materials. Uh, we can also move at uh, shorter distances by our clothes, tools, or other equipment. Um, so if you're, you're working with a tree that does have canker or you suspect cankers in the area, you're going to want to um, decontaminate those tools using uh, something we recommend household bleach in one ounce to a gallon of, of water. Uh, do caution you that uh, if, you're, if your loppers or whatever you're trying to clean is fairly covered in, in uh, plant tissues, you're going to want to clean that first and then disinfest. Uh, because the bleach won't be effective, but also that that solution loses its strength every daily. And so you need to have a fresh solution for it to be effective. When trying to control canker on the fruit, uh, we recommend copper products every 21 days again um, versus pressing fruit infections. However, this is much less effective for leaf infection and therefore it's not particularly effective in reducing spread. Um, if you do have canker, uh, this used to be a big issue in terms of the quarantines and the eradication pro program, which is now defunct. Uh, but we still wish people not to transport samples unless they're double bagged um, and water, making sure that hands are washed with soap and after handling samples. Pruning away your infected areas is another thing that you can do and try and if you've got a small infestation and dispose of that in your lawn waste stream or um, burning, but depending on your local reg regulations. If you've got a new tree that you can change it, change locations as to where you're going to plant, try and find a wind sheltered location like a, a spot where you've got two fences meeting perhaps. Uh, the fruit are safe to eat, but they're pretty unsightly. That bacteria will not harm humans and they, uh, but they can, as I said, cause the fruit to, to fall off. And so that's a problem. The last disease I'm going to talk about is probably our biggest problem, as we've all talked about earlier today, Huang Lung Bing or uh, greeting. Um, and I'm just going to talk about the leaf symptom or the symptoms of, on the trees, uh, just so you can recognize them easily. So leaf symptoms, the familiar blotchy model pattern, which is really just an asymmetrical chlorosis. Uh, and looking at that across the mid vein, as you can see here, the two sides do not look the same. If you look, try to determine whether you've got nutrient deficiency instead, you would look, uh, do something like a pen test where you would draw two circles on either side of the mid vein and see if the, the uh, patterns are symmetrical. If they are not, uh, then it's likely something like greening. Although I do recommend uh, when you looking at blotchy model leaves or suspect leaves that to actually turn them over and make sure there's not something like a leaf mine on the other side, because I have seen that do a pretty good mimic of uh, HLB blotchy model. We other symptoms we get are uh, yellow veins, uh, which is somewhat happening here on this picture or vein corking, but both of these can be also signs of things like or broken limbs. So it's good to follow down and look for blotchy model in addition. Um, fruit symptoms, they're small, misshapen and lopsided fruit. Uh, here's an example of a color inverted fruit. And then uh, you'll also get uh, yellow, um, yellow veins underneath the abscission zone. So where the fruit comes off the tree, uh, if you cut it open, uh, sometimes this columella or the central core of the fruit can be distorted along with the um, lopsidedness and uh, you get aborted seeds. Uh, tree symptoms, uh, you get a lot of leaf and fruit drop on badly affected trees. These are actually some very sad looking trees from my neighborhood. Um, 
and uh, you can see this one has finally died uh, in the last year, but this is a typical example of what you see in the land homescape if these trees are not carefully uh, managed. Yellow shoots um, are common on uh, younger trees. You can see sectoring in the canopy here, um, but uh, severely infected trees are stunted. Uh, this tree here is probably 14 years old, but it looks like it was planted three years ago. Uh, you've got sparse foliation, twig dieback. I think that tree exhibits it all uh, and uh, off season bloom can occur as well. Um, if you're unsure if it's HLB or not, or you just have to have the question answered, is my tree truly infected with the disease and it's not good enough to go by symptoms? You have two options to try and answer that question. The Division of Plant Industry and the Plant Disease Clinic in Gainesville uh, will do a PCR test uh, for the bacterium. And uh, this is the, but these are not free services. Uh, and they would like you to contact them in advance to, to find out the details on how to send a sample and what type of samples they would like best. Um, so what to do if your tree does have HLB? Well, we know that there's no cure once a tree is infected and you can't prune away the disease. Uh, however, you can support the tree nutritionally as much as possible and Dr. Vashith will be giving probably a lot more detail than I could possibly fit in here. Um, and. Uh, and the other thing is if your tree has declined like the ones in my, my neighborhood um, and you don't want to see it anymore because it bothers you, uh, tree removal is really the ultimate control for HLB, uh, but that's really at your discretion. Uh, but if you are going to take that, uh, uh, going, to, going to do that procedure, then we would ask you to please kill the tree stump when you remove the tree uh, because otherwise the uh, stump will sprout. Uh, those sprouts will be highly infective. Uh, be, and the psyllids will be attracted to that nice new flush and then they will be spreading that to any new trees that you choose to put in and then that'll be really difficult for those new trees uh, because they will, will be starting off at a, in a bad place. Um, if you're in a master gardener clinic and you're handling a suspected canker or HLB uh, sample on the phone, uh, one of the first things we do recommend is to have the client send a digital photo. Uh, but if for whatever reason that's not working, you're not able to make a decision, um, it might be necessary to ask the uh, homeowner to bring in a sample. We ask those to be double bagged in, and then brought it before they're brought in. And if you're unable to positively diagnose the sample as citrus or HLB, uh, we recommend consulting your local horticultural agent or contacting a member of the state citrus extension team but if it is determined to be canker, uh, provide the UF IFAS li literature for further uh, information and current management recommendations. And that can all be found on that homeowner website that Fernando mentioned. Or um, HLB, if it's determined to be HLB, uh, you want to advise the homeowner that that tree can decline and become unproductive in a few years without careful care. Uh, so, And then again, provide UF IFAS literature to assist them in keeping that tree as healthy for as long as possible. Some just quick general reminders about, um, about diseases. Uh, cultural measures are really your first line of defense, particularly in the homeowner uh, setting for any disease. Pesticides are not always necessary or effective. Uh, the tree appearance may suffer, but the tree is not necessarily damaged. Uh, this is particularly in terms of the fungal diseases. Don't panic. It may look a little ugly, but it, it's not gonna hurt you. And uh, there's uh, sometimes minimal uh, damage to the trees in the, except for on the long term. Um, external fruit blemishes do not uh, affect the internal quality. Uh, even for canker, the fruit is still ed edible. It's just not attractive. Uh, of course, HLB, that's not the case. Uh, well, the fruit is edible, but it just doesn't taste particularly good. And as needed, horticultural oil and copper fungicides are really your only two major options in the home landscape. Uh, setting. And if we have time, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I think we have a little bit of time, uh, Dr. Dudney. Um, we do have some questions. Uh, the first of which was, would greasy spot get on um, other horticulture plants, uh, specifically like a milkweed? Uh, 
Not that I'm aware of. I think that disease is very specific to citrus. Yeah, I, I, I think that's true. Um, and then Donald wants to know 90% uh, alcohol, could that be used to disinfect tools for canker? Uh, I would actually prefer a 70% alcohol solution if you want to use alcohol. Um, it could also be used. It's just that people don't have that as often in their uh, in their uh, home household. Uh, but seventy percent is actually more effective for uh, piercing the membranes, and that has to do with the uh, chemistry of the membrane. And so, seventy percent ethanol is preferred. So, actually, a less uh, more dilute solution. Okay, that's awesome to know. Um, I know that this has to do with insects, but I'll throw it, I'll toss it at you anyway. Uh, do we recommend removing the leaf miner damage leaves? Uh, well, if, you're, if your uh, infestation is quite light, then I think that would probably be feasible. However, sometimes on the summer flush in particular, leaf miner damage can be so overwhelming, you'd be removing all the new leaves from the tree. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, thank you. And then um, both Tina and Jill are wondering how, if you remove that HLB infected tree, how do you go about killing those roots or that stump? Uh, probably something uh, like Roundup that you can easily procure from the uh, local uh, home a garden store should be able to take care of it, um, especially if you drill into the stump and then put a fairly concentrated solution on. Really good advice. Okay, I, those, those were our questions. Uh, excellent presentations.